Good morning. Welcome to our worship service from Gordon Street Christian Church. We are thankful that you are worshiping with us, uh, being bound together with us by one Holy Spirit, and lifting our hearts to our Creator with praise and thanksgiving for all the goodness He has shown us. And happy Independence Day to all of you. Uh, we do have much for which to be grateful. Uh, in this country in which we live, we have been abundantly blessed. At this time, we will begin our worship. Our call to worship this morning is from the Psalms, the 48th Psalm, verses 9 and 10. We ponder your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Your name, O God, like your praise, reaches to the ends of the earth. Our hymn of praise this morning is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. bow with me for the invocation and then join me praying the Lord's Prayer. Lord, we know we are not yet all we should be, but your power and your confidence in us will make us able to fulfill the work you give us to do. Help us never be discouraged to the point of giving up. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The epistle lesson is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, 
so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we look around us and we see the abundance of your love for us in the things that we see, the beauty of the earth, the beauty of flowers and trees, the beauty of rain and sunshine, the beauty of all your creation. We see your creativity and your power. All around us we look and we see how you have loved us, how you have cared for us. In our days we have faced times of great joy and you rejoiced with us, times of great struggle and you were there supplying us strength for those days. You have brought us even to this hour and we lift our hearts to you with thanksgiving. We know also that we have sinned against you. We have not earned the least of all the blessings you've given us. We ask forgiveness of our sins as you have given us that forgiveness time and time again. We ask that you cleanse us from unrighteousness and strengthen us with your Holy Spirit so that as temptation comes, we will be able to to resist it in accordance with your will. We give you thanks that you have called us to be your people, that you have called us not just for privilege, but also for responsibility. We thank you that you have trusted us, entrusted us with your work. And we pray that your spirit will guide us that we might see the many things that you would have us do for the sake of your kingdom. We pray that you will empower us and strengthen us to do those things. We remember those who are sick, those who have lost loved ones, those who are going through great difficulties. We pray that you will be with all of them, fulfilling their needs in accordance with your will. We pray for those who are caregivers and who are doing the best that they can in situations that are difficult. We pray that you will surround them and guide them in all that they do. We pray for our, ourselves that you will search our hearts and minds and fulfill our deepest needs in accordance with your will. And we know that you will because you do love us. You have shown us that love again and again. We thank you for the nation in which we live. We thank you for the freedom, the independence that we have had. We thank you for the abundant blessings that we have here. But we pray that you will help us to rise up to our responsibilities, that we might be used of you to, to bless others, not just ourselves, that you will use us as a nation to reach out to all in the world and, and show them the way of peace and the, the way of righteousness. We pray that all nations will come to a knowledge of your truth, that we are all part of one human family, 
and that we should work together and lift one another up rather than tear one another down. We pray for your church in this place. We pray for your church across our state, across our nation, and across the world. May we be faithful in sharing and showing your love to all people. May we be faithful in bearing your light that it might shine through us to others around us. And may that day come when all will know you, when all will give glory to your holy name. As we read your holy word, we thank you for that word and pray that your Holy Spirit will give us insight and understanding and that we might learn to serve you better. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our risen and exalted Lord. Amen. Our scripture text for tonight comes from, or for today, comes from chapter 6 of Mark's Gospel. The first verse going through the 13th verse. Listen for the word of the Lord. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are be do being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Here ends the reading from God's holy word. May he add his blessings to our understanding of it. Let us pray. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our Redeemer and our strength. Amen. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have been in the Holy Land back in the time when Jesus was going from village to village and teaching, when he was going and doing his mighty works of power, can you imagine what it would have been like to have been in that crowd and heard the things that he said? I know that I have often thought about that. What would it have felt like to have heard his voice, to have felt the power of that teaching to have seen the wonderful works of power that he did. But I've also been thankful that I was not there, thankful that I did not encounter Jesus on that side of the resurrection because I am not sure whether I would have received him or not, whether I would have believed him or not. You and I, as Christians, in this day and time, on this side of the resurrection, may wonder, how is it that people do not receive Jesus? Here is this wonderful person sent from God, one whose power was glorious, one whose teaching astounded people, and we wonder, how did they not receive him? How did they not believe him? But I can understand why they might not have believed. I can understand why they might not have received him. 
because as they heard his teaching, if they kept hearing that teaching and taking it seriously, they would have realized that much of what he taught did not square with the way people lived. Much of what he taught uh, would have condemned their attitudes toward others, their way of treating others. There were a lot of people who heard Jesus and who were amazed at what he said. But we don't know how many of those people were willing to incorporate that teaching into their own lives. The fact of the matter is, the same thing is true today. Many people who claim to be Christian and who are Christian, uh, you and I included, if we were to take Jesus' teachings truly seriously, we would find that those teachings call into questions many of our normal ways of doing things. It would call into question how uh, our policies in, in our communities and in our nation and in the world uh, treat people and, and hurt people and, and all of those kinds of things. We go about life and we assume that uh, our ways are righteous ways and that they are in accord with the teaching of Jesus. But if we take those teachings seriously, we might find that they are not in that accord. And all of us are guilty. Uh, we could give some examples of some of the things, some of the attitudes that we have, some of the things that we consider righteous attitudes that really do not square with Jesus' teaching. And we might begin to look at those with those attitudes and put them down when in fact all of us are guilty. Our scripture text is of a time when Jesus had been on a teaching tour going in various places around Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. They had heard that astounding teaching. They had seen him cast out demons. They had seen him heal the sick. He was becoming quite famous. Here is this young rabbi doing great things, teaching great things. Doesn't mean that they all wanted to follow those teachings, but they were excited about this young rabbi. And many people wanted to hear him. And he seemed to be quite successful there for a little while. But then he came to Nazareth his own hometown. Now you would think in his own hometown that he would be well received, that they would go out and welcome him in, this young man who came from among us and has, has done well in other parts of our region. They would want to hear what he had to say, see what he could do. Uh, they would be proud of him, but it seems that that wasn't the way it was. On the Sabbath, he went into their synagogue and began to teach. Now, typical of Mark's gospel, Mark did not tell us the content of his teaching. Luke tells us a little more, but that's a different story. That content, though, whatever it was, did not sit well with the people of Nazareth. Now, Jesus had grown up at Nazareth. He had probably played with their children as he himself was a child growing up there. He was known in that synagogue. His parents were known. He might have worked for some of them out of his father's carpenter shop. These were people who knew him best, who were closest to him. And they probably said to themselves as he was coming into their synagogue to teach, what does he know that we don't already know? What does he have that he did not get from us? He is just one of us. He's nothing extraordinary or special. He's just like us. 
whatever it was that he was teaching, they took offense at him according to Mark. And yielding to the temptation to go to Luke and tell you what Luke says happened, these people became so upset with Jesus that they tried to kill him. Imagine that. Your own neighbors and friends and family rising up against you. Your own people rejecting you. Now, rejection is difficult. Anyone who's ever been rejected at any time can probably say that it is hard, no matter who the people are who are rejecting you. But it is especially hard. If those who are rejecting you are the people who know you the best, the people that you have loved the best, the people who you have always been with. And I can imagine that it would have been very, very discouraging to have come with this teaching, this wonderful teaching, and find rejection from your own people. Now, some people, when they get discouraged, will give up. If these who know me best are so angry with what I have to say that they are willing to even try to kill me, maybe I'm just not cut out to be a teacher and preacher. Maybe this thing that I am doing is, is just not meant for me. Maybe I should go out and do something else. Some people are tempted to give up. On the other hand, there are those who feel very strongly that the things that they are saying and doing are exactly right. They are the truth and must be proclaimed regardless of whether they are rejected or not. And they might redouble their efforts in order to convince these people that what you're doing is right. Well, what did Jesus do? Jesus didn't spend his time trying to convince the people at Nazareth. He knew it was a waste of time. It was just as much a waste of time as it is in our day and time for uh, Democrats on the left and Republicans on the right to try to convince one another that their stance is correct. Those who are deeply entrenched in, in one extreme or the other are not likely to listen to the other side, not likely to be converted to the ideas of the other side. But Jesus didn't give up. He didn't stay in Nazareth. He didn't try to convince them anymore. Instead, he went on to other towns and other villages and proclaimed the word and continued his work. Mark says of his time in Nazareth that he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. That's a sad commentary. When you think about what could have been if the people there had welcomed Jesus, if they had opened their hearts and minds to his teaching, if they had uh, decided that that teaching was something that they could live by so that his very spirit would transform their lives, it could have been different, much different. Nazareth might have been a shining light in all of Israel if they had just accepted his word and followed him. But as it was, Nazareth was always considered less than what a town or village ought to be. Of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these. It might have been. They rejected him. But Jesus didn't give up. He saw that there was no use to continue there. He moved on to other towns and other villages teaching. 
And then he did another strange thing. He called the 12 disciples to himself. Remember, these 12 disciples were full of fault, faults and failures, just like you and I are. These 12 disciples often didn't understand his teaching. These 12 disciples were not even sure yet that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. And yet Jesus called them to him, called them to himself. And, and then he sent them out. Sent them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaim that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Isn't it strange that Jesus trusted these disciples with all their faults and failures, with their indecision about whether he was Messiah or not? He entrusted them with his work and empowered them to do the things that he was doing, casting out demons, healing the sick. He did trust them because he had supplied the power that they would need to do the things they would need to do. And so instead of giving up, he continued the work and instead of doing it on his own, he shared the responsibility with those who were following him. We might wonder why Jesus would entrust his work to you and I because we too are full of faults and failures. We too are guilty of sometimes not taking his teaching seriously. But he has loved us and entrusted to us his work. And he warned his disciples, said, some places will not receive you. Some places will want you to leave. And if that's the case, just shake off the dust of your feet and move on. Go where you can do some good. Don't worry about what you leave behind. Don't let that hinder you in any way from doing the work in the places where you can do it. Don't even carry the weight of the dust of their towns on your shoes. Leave it all behind and move forward. We need to remember that all of us get discouraged at times. Life is not easy for anyone. There are times when anyone, no matter how strong they are, may become discouraged. There are times when they wonder why it is they are doing what they do. But Jesus has taught us that when we find in those particular times that there's nothing more that we can do there, to move on to where we can do what he wants us to do. But do not, do not give up. And the power and presence and, and the love that he has for us and with us can shine through us and lives can be touched. And it, you would be amazed at what your work, your example your deed of kindness, your deed of love can cause to happen in the kingdom of God. Things that we probably do not even uh, become aware of in this life. We find out 
as that text went on, that those disciples also were successful in the places where they went. They touched many lives and they made a difference for a lot of people. The power of the risen Lord is with us. He has promised that he is with us always, even to the end of the age. And so we have no reason to lose hope, no reason to be discouraged. We do the Lord's work the best that we can do it and keep moving forward. Our God has shown us the example in Christ Jesus, our Lord. May we be faithful in following that example and may by doing what he has asked us to do, may we learn even more of his love and his saving power. We thank God for all his blessings. Our Lord knew that there would be times of great discouragement among his people. He himself had been rejected by those who were closest to him. He knew what that felt like, but he also knew that the work had to continue. He knew that you and I and his people throughout all ages of time would face just as much opposition, just as much resistance, and that there would be times when one thing after another would go wrong and we would be discouraged. 
but in his own life, in his own example, he reminded us that we can still move ahead. One of the things that he has given us as his disciples, as his followers, is the communion at his table. He knew that as we came together as part of his own family, we would encourage one another, we would be strengthened by one another and especially by his presence in this place. He knew that as we remembered what he had gone through for us, how he had suffered and died and rose again, that we would be encouraged by a love that is greater than description. We come to this table not because we've earned a spot, but because he has invited us, because he loves us, because he forgives us. We partake of bread that remind us of his body given for us. We partake of a cup that reminds us of his blood shed for us. We are grateful for these gifts and grateful especially that his love was the power that brought him back from the dead so that he is here present with us now to strengthen and guide and empower us for all our days. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the gifts that you have given us through your own life. We thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for the empowerment to become your own people, your own family, the empowerment to become those through whom your work will be done. Help us as we are gathered here to be bound to you and to one another in love. May that love Fill our hearts with joy, a joy that cannot be contained, but that will spill over to all those around us. We thank you for this bread and for this cup. May we be nourished in spirit and strengthened for your service. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we recall, on the same night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a like manner after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sin. Drink you this, and remember that Christ died for you, and be thankful. Let us pray. Lord, again, we thank you for your gift of your own life, a life that gives us life and love and joy and peace. Thank you for receiving us around your table and including us in this celebration of love. May your love multiply within us and be shared among us and beyond us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the Lord our Maker, be all honor and glory, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen.